Hello. <laughs> Great to see you. I, I get to start, just for the record. Uh, welcome to my office. Um, this has been inhabited by numerous men who smoke cigars. <laughs> I am delighted it no longer is. Can you still smell the cigar smoke sometimes? I hope not. <laughs> I will do everything I can to cleanse that. Um, I think you all, we were just talking to you, were you all on the Appropriations Committee in the 90s? I'm not sure, when did, so, but probably pretty soon after that then, right, after you. Um, so tell me about what it was like um, in, the, in the Congress, but also in, in the Appropriations Committee so many years ago. I found it surprising there were so few women I just didn't think about that, but I remember at that time there weren't a lot of women. Yeah, I, I remember um, conference committees because we actually did a lot of them in the early 90s where the most senior members were in the middle of the table and the most junior members were way out here, and the men would talk to each other right here. And I remember finally just standing up at the end of the table going, excuse me, because you couldn't get their attention. Everything was decided in the middle of this table. I think it's pretty amazing. We, we are at the middle of the table now. That's right. We're the table. And the whole. you are the table. Um, how did you get their attention in those? I yelled. <laughs> <laughs> and I passed my amendment, so I was pretty excited. And it's probably well. not an appropriations uh, a story, but I think I, you, you, you know, I, I, I look now at the, the walls of the um, appropriations room 2359, which uh, Shalanda knows very, very well. <laughs> and there's only one woman uh, with portraits there, and that's Nita Lowy. The biggest portrait. The biggest portrait. <laughs> and the brightest portrait, and it jumps out at you. But the experience I had in, in first coming, and when I came, there were about 14 women. Um, and uh, I testified before the Defense Appropriations Committee um, on, of all things, the uh, uh, Abrams M1A1 tank, because the engine was produced in um, my district in Stratford, Connecticut. And so I went before the committee and talked about the need for the engine and the M1A1 tank and how important it was to national security, et cetera, went through the whole litany. And the uh, chair of the time, uh, Kay, was Jerry Lewis uh, uh, of, of California. And he looked at me and he said, uh, Congresswoman, uh, can you talk about the, um, uh, the Abrams tank and the engine without looking at your notes? Oops. And I looked right up and I said, damn straight I can. And uh, I solidified my relationship with the then ranking member who later became chair, which was um, Jack Murtha, who winked at me. And, uh, you know, we, we, we bonded, <laughs> you know, at that, at that moment. But that's... You, you know, all of us have probably had experiences like that uh, here, and not so unusual with regard to the Appropriations uh, Committee as well. You have to work harder as women in this institution. Very true. You have to know what you're talking about. When I was uh, first sworn in, in 1997, there were only nine women in the Senate. And that was not a sufficient number of women for there to be a woman on every committee. I fairly soon afterwards became chairman of the Senate Homeland Security Committee. And I remember one hearing where I looked to my left and I looked to my right, and all of a sudden I realized I was the only woman on the committee. I looked out, and Donald Rumsfeld, who was then Secretary of Defense, was testifying. And the whole panel was male. And then I thought, I'm the only woman testifying or as a member of this committee. And then I smiled, and I thought, but I'm in charge. <laughs> and, but it is astonishing, if you think about it that there were so few women that there were not a sufficient number of women so that we were represented on every committee. And I don't mean to imply that all women think alike. We span the ideological spectrum. But women bring different life experiences and different perspectives. And that's why it matters. And different goals. We want to get something done, which is what we all share this time around, is that we don't want to mess in a maloo at the end of the year. We are pragmatic. 
We want to work together. We've all talked about that because we really want to show to each of us, want to show the country that this process can work and we can get things done. Do you think you're more collaborative or more communicative? Obviously, you can't generalize too much, but... Absolutely. Without a doubt. I, 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 will, I will put money on that statement and that sentiment. And I'm going to throw OMB in here. Yeah. I might be the, the one OMB director you all would invite uh, to do this. I probably am the... Is that correct? That's the, correct. The, the, the one who loves this committee uh, and these women most. I want them to be successful, and I'll do what I can from... Um, my role to make sure they're successful because that's good for the country. Um, and my dream job was being staff director on their committee, and I got to do that. And I kind of succeeded beyond my wildest belief. But my, I, I didn't even have the goal to be staff director. Like So I, I'm uh, all in and bought in on what they're doing because I remind people they're one place that still does hand-to-hand -hand combat negotiations. It's ugly. It's late. But they get it done. And can you imagine like losing the one last place where both parties have to talk to each other? Uh, the administration has to engage with Congress and that dialogue has to happen um, for the betterment of people. No matter the differences, every last one of them want what's best for the American people and that's to get something done. And you don't have to compromise your values. None of them ever will um, to find a solution. And one of my jobs uh, is to make sure that they're successful in theirs and uh, get them what they need. And they're all going to hit me up about that's many right. things uh, in the near future to make sure that's possible. And you're previewing one of my questions, actually, so I'm just going to go ahead and ask it now, which is wh why, how do you think you're different than your predecessors um, in terms of your relationships? Because I grew up with Congress. them. I grew up looking up to them. I mean, literally... The two over there threw a baby shower for me um, when I decided to, to start a family. Um, and you cannot replace those relationships. I've never run for office, uh, but I do know that you don't show up to church during election season um, and expect to have those relationships. You probably need to pick up the phone every now and then and show up. Um, and we don't have to start from scratch. Like I, I became who I am on the committee that they now lead. Uh, so that's a special relationship. I would, and I'd say from our part, she is the best. I, I pick up the phone and call her, text her, whatever. I get an immediate response. Mm -hmm. That is new for me. And that's that not agency. happened before. Yeah. But, yeah. And this is in case you think about it, because I know you're talking about a historic moment, but this is a moment in time. You are really looking at five women who have control of the most powerful level, le levers of government. Now, that's, but, but, but how? And for me, in many instances, transcends uh, ge gender. Think about each, each of us sitting here. Um, what defines us? What is it? it it's knowledge, the deep knowledge of of, of not of the, the, the content, but the process, the skills, experience, effectiveness of knowing how to get a, a, a policy over the, 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 the finish line. Uh, and in, in this regard is that, that that's what's dominant here. We didn't get here because we are women. We did not get here because we're women. And if you think of each one, and Shalanda is a legislative uh, expert has the deepest knowledge of the budget process, but each mm -hmm. of us here, fierce advocates for our state, for our, our district, we don't take no for an answer, and we don't give up. You know, it's a lengthy process in which you're engaged in, and I think our constituents know that, but I think our colleagues That's know right. that as well. And I think that that defines it is the, 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 the leadership, and as I, I, I just say, this surpasses and it transcends, transcends gender. Yeah. You know, we didn't get here because we were women. Yeah. It does, but I think we also help each other. We yes. have some, a new woman will come in for something like that, and so we, can you help you? Can you, you know, what are you, what's your goal, that sort of thing? Mm -hmm. And so you have a, a, a relationship there of, yes, we, we help each mm -hmm. other and, uh, and wish each other well. And Mikulski did that, if I'm not yeah. mistaken, right? Didn't she do? So I, I'm not totally familiar with it, but I think she. What she always did was invite the freshman 
women senators into her office to teach us about the appropriations process. And she called it her workshop. And it was very valuable. It gave us a lot of tips as well as a deeper understanding of how to be effective. There was no handbook on how to be an appropriator. Right. right. So we have to teach everybody that came along. Barbara was our teacher, every one of us, really. But, you know, I think what you hear here is that not only are we good communicators, and we talk to each other, all of us, and we have to do that, but we are also good listeners, and we also do our homework. I know when I'm talking to Susan that she's in that room and knows this issue and that account and what the tripwires are more than anyone. And I better not walk into that room unprepared, right? (laughs) (laughs) You know, so we do our homework, as someone said earlier, and we get to the details and we communicate them. And I think that's how we will be successful. So how is... Sorry, put you back. I think we've all experienced uh, young women that... We can, they'll say, well, how did you get to be where you are? And so it's a, it's, it's a very different situation than it was so far back a long time ago because there's so few of us, but it's really wonderful to be able to help some women coming up in these, these positions, other positions. We may be the first women doing this. We do not want to be the last. Not the That's last. what Barbara McCarthy would say. Um, and how have things changed since those days in the 90s and early 2000s when you all were just getting here? How, how is Congress? I mean, there's some obvious changes. It's much more partisan than it used to be in a lot of ways. How has it changed for, for women, do you think, and for you all in particular? Well, the dynamic has changed. The environment has changed. There, so I came in 14 women. and uh, the Senator came. There were nine, nine women. There were... You know, so few of us. I was six. You know, you were we're six. Okay, exactly. I don't know. But the numbers were, 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 you know, very small. And you don't know, no matter how you package it, even now, we are not the, the majority. But the environment has changed profoundly, you know. And women, in the past, a lot of young women are running for office, those with children. And earlier on, you know, if you had young kids, you know, this was probably not what you were going to choose as a profession, you know, what all the mores around that were, whether you were leaving your kids or, you know, so forth. But that's changed. So it's involved many, many more women. Look at the agenda, how that's changed over the years because of the influence of women. And, you you know, I think that there is a healthy respect. Um, uh, You know, as I said earlier, we do have to work hard. You still have to stand up and know what you're talking about. You have to answer the first, second, third, and fourth question. I, I want to hear what Susan has to say, but I'll, I'll answer that a little differently. When I came here, we did get appropriations bills done. There was a process. Right. Right. We did work across mm-hmm. the aisle. We, we negotiated those bills, and that has changed dramatically. And I think that's what we want to change. Not go back to the good old boys, but go back to working together, working in a bipartisan way, knowing that we've got to agree and disagree on things. But at the end of the day, we have to produce a budget. Why is that important? Every family has to have a budget. And I think what you see in front of you is five women who are determined to get us back to that place where we can show the American people that despite our differences, we can get things done. Well, we did that last December. I said that. You, Patty, last December, in divided government, with a two-vote majority on the Democratic side in the House, we were able to pass a bill, and if we wanted to get done in December, we all wanted to get that done, including Shalanda, getting it done in December. Rosetta had some very, very lively <laughs> conversations. <laughs> but it was, we had, you know, bipartisan. These bills have to be bipartisan and bicameral in order for the president to sign it. And we got it done. Uh, so, as Patty would say, it's, it's, we can get it done. But this is a new... So, oh, sorry, go ahead. So, Patty and I have a history of getting it done. Uh, when we were the chair and ranking member of the subcommittee with jurisdiction over transportation and housing, we always produced a bipartisan <laughs> appropriations bill in those areas. But I want to go back to the question that you asked earlier. One way that it has changed is when I was first elected back in and took office in 1997, men were assumed to have the qualifications to be a senator. 
And if they were elected, it was just automatically assumed that they belonged here. Women had to prove ourselves. There was always an extra barrier to prove that we belonged in the Senate. Now, once you pass that test, mm -hmm. then you were accepted and you were part of the club. But there was that extra barrier that was definitely in place, still exists to some extent, but far less than it used to. So I remember a time where I was meeting with someone uh, who was making a proposal and I had my staff, he had his staff, and we were talking, and I was seated about like you, and so he would always turn to the man and, and ask the questions. Mm -hmm. And and I would answer, and that so finally I said, would you stand up, please? He said, yes, there's something wrong. I said, no, I think that if you move over there, you can then probably talk to me and see me. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. And, it, and, and what did he say? He was very embarrassed. Yeah. But you, those things would just happen then because they just assumed, well, if, if you're in charge, you've got the desk, then you're a man. And, and it also happened where if a woman said something, nobody would say anything until a man said the same thing that a woman right. did. And then everybody would go, oh, yeah, what he said. That happens but less rare, but still un less Unfortunately, less. less rare, but it happens. Yes. Um, and I do think one thing you all have in common, uh, and I've seen it from my angle, um, you, you help me do my job. Um, it's nothing for me to pick up a call, and we have an honest and frank dialogue with all four of you. Because um, I think you want me to succeed. I certainly want you to succeed. And I do think that is a value of that women bring to the table. Um, and there's not competition here. There's a genuine want uh, to deliver. Again, not compromising values. People don't have to do that. Uh, disagree vehemently <laughs> uh, when it's necessary. But this collaborative relationship that's continuous, you can't just call people uh, at the last minute when you need them, you have to keep a keep an open dialogue. And how it's changed, just facts. When I got here in 2001, a man held every one of these positions. Lovely guys, uh, <laughs> lovely men, um, but they were all men. This country is, does not look like that. It's not right. Um, most Americans don't know what their appropriations committee is, but if they heard uh, that... Um, you know, women didn't have a seat at the table on how investments were distributed, like that, that would be a problem. $1.7 <laughs> trillion dollars every year. We can pass massive pieces of legislation which exist for five years or for 10 years, but these bills have to be passed every year. And it's the livelihoods of everyone in this country are tied up in these 12 subcommittees. So how are you going to do that this year? I guess that's sort of the, the big question, right? I mean, we've got a new Republican House, um, where we saw what happened with um, Speaker McCarthy's election. There's a lot of um, desire for really deep cuts. Um, obviously, you're closest to this, um, but for all of you, how do you plan on, it's, it's a tougher job this year, it seems. I think talking to each other, staying in close communication, no surprises, trying to understand the other person's perspective and what they're dealing with so we can get to the end goal of, having our country. And, and understanding the nature of the, of the legislative bodies as well. It's what you need, what you, you need to be able to get a bill passed. Also, I don't know anybody on either side of the aisle, in either chamber, who wants a huge end of the year after the fiscal year has already begun bill that bundles together funding for every single federal agency. That's no one's goal. So given that, I'm hopeful that we can make improvements in the process. I'm not saying we're going to be able to solve every problem, get every bill across the president's desk uh, before the start of the fiscal year on October 1st. But I truly believe we can make real progress by working closely together. And what are the stakes, just for your average person who might not understand, you know, what, what are the stakes in funding the government? What are the stakes if there's a default? What, what would you tell average Americans? Well, it's, it's their, it really is every aspect of their lives. It's about their health care. It's about education, their 
children's education. It's about our national security. Uh, it's about our infrastructure. Every single subcommittee of appropriations uh, uh, plays a significant role uh, in uh, how, how working families, middle class families, how the vulnerable make their way uh, every day, how they achieve financial stability, how we work uh, you know, with them. That, that's the impact, and we have to communicate that with them as well. Yeah, you know, Kay and I talked about this the other day, that one thing I think people don't want today is chaos. They would like to know that they don't have to worry about whether their government's going to shut down or the economy's going to collapse, or whether something that they rely on, whether it's LIHEAP or whether it's education or whether it's, you know, what they need in their daily lives is going to be held up or some big argument. They would like us to do our jobs. And yeah, they're not going to love every decision. Um, we're not all going to agree on every decision, but they don't want chaos. And I think that's certainly my goal. There are also practical consequences. When we don't pass bills on time, it means that new programs can't start that old programs that perhaps should be terminated continue to be funded, and it increased the cost to taxpayers. So in many ways, it represents a failure to govern effectively. And from the executive branch, you see how the agencies really cannot be efficient, um, effective in delivering everything you tell us to do. Uh, there's just no way under CR after CR a uh, threat of shutdown, uh, that these agencies can do what they, they're tasked to do in an effective manner when there's no sure path uh, to a funding regime. Uh, I knew that here. I really see it uh, clearly in the executive branch uh, having to implement many of the things uh, you pass, um, and it makes it, it makes it difficult for, DO, you know, people use DOD, for example, but that's one agency. All of them have, if they're going into the year, half the year with uncertainty, they really can't do anything, even basic grants. We don't uh, issue grants for most government programs under CRs because we're not sure what the final number is. So we have to haul all that back from your communities uh, until we have a clear path. And so I'll just, just end on one last question, particularly to the, the House leaders. And how do you plan to navigate these sort of demands for cuts in spending um, that seem pretty serious and, and McCarthy's speakership might rely on it. How are you going to navigate that this year? Well, first of all, we say this is what we're going to do and this is when it has to be final. And so those deadlines are very important and we, we stand by those, those deadlines. We also, when you're talking about as many different facets of what we're all doing, is explaining that to the public. Um, so I think we all make appearances and just try to explain how we do it uh, what kind of terms we have to have, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I always like to, if I'm talking to an audience, to see young women in that audience and that are listening closely because they'll do the same, can do the same thing we've done. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we will do, there are, there are differences, but the process has worked. We passed an omnibus bill in December. The government did not shut down. It was, was it easy? No. It was hard. And we, both uh, Kay and I, we went through the process on the House side. Of every single bill went through subcommittee, full committee. Six got to the floor of the House, etc. So in terms of engaging in the process, as, as Senator Collins pointed out, we're prepared to do that. Yes, there will be... We're, None of us are, have our head in the sand. We know there, there are difficulties going to be involved. But the, 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 both sides have different interests, different, uh, and you can come together on those, those interests. There are a number of people who care deeply about what happens to the National Institutes of Health. They're on both sides of the aisle. A number of people who care deeply about what's happening with job training and apprenticeships. People who care about defense, people who care about veterans. So it's building those coalitions that will allow us to be able to move. And that's what we're trying to do. We will work to build the coalitions that will allow us to get these bills passed and do the business of the American people. 
Great. Thank you so much. I could talk to you all day. <laughs> You're telling me I have so to wrap much. up. But um, thank you so much for, for talking to us. And, yeah, yeah. I have been too. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me.